The scripture today is Luke 13, 31 through 35. It can be found in the New Testament of your pew Bible on page 72. The lament over Jerusalem. <clears throat> At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing, and you are not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Well, if you've ever been to Greenfield, Massachusetts, you might have been traveling west on Route 2. And if you keep going west from Greenfield, Massachusetts, you'll go over the Mohawk Trail, and just as you get to the end of the Mohawk Trail, the, the uh, road dips down into the city of North Adams at what's called the Hairpin Turn. And if you pull off the road at the Hairpin Turn, you can look out and see the whole city of North Adams, Massachusetts. I've stopped there once or twice, and when you look out over that city, you see the grand history that that city once had. Large factories that are quite silent now. Evidence of an industrial prowess of another day. But if you look a little longer, you can begin to see the efforts that that city is making at a rebirth. A place of cultural enrichment and recreation. Of course, whenever I look out over the city of North Adams, it's with a little bit of fondness. That's the city that Kathy came from, and I remember the wonderful people in her family circle, so grateful for them and for her. If you've ever been to Greenfield, Massachusetts, you might have been heading south along Route 91. In about 40 or 45 minutes, you'll get to the line between East Hampton and Holyoke. And if you look just off to the southwest, the southeast, you'll see this grand vista. And you can look down and see the city of Holyoke. Well, the buildings aren't quite as easy to make out. But the city of Holyoke has a grand history, a place where wave after wave of immigrant came to America, much like the cities of Lawrence and of Lowell. It's kind of exhilarating from that perspective. Of course, I look on that city with fondness as well. But there's a young woman named Paula who was our foster daughter for far too short a period of time. And that's where she makes her home and lives her life beautifully. There's something about getting to a vantage point where you see things just a little differently. When for a moment you get a glimpse of the big picture. When you're not quite so overwhelmed by the detail, but you see the vast scope. 
something comes to us in those moments. Jesus was at such a vantage point. He looked out over the city of Jerusalem. Oh, he might have seen the Roman legions that were occupying the city and the fear and the mistrust and the brokenness. And I'm sure he saw the Jewish resistance to the occupation, the desperate warfare. And so he laments, O oh, Jerusalem, O oh, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who have been sent to you, I would have gathered you under my wing as a mother hen gathers her brood. But you would not. And of course, by the time Luke tells us this story, those tensions have already risen into war. The Romans had already desecrated the city of Jerusalem, making Jesus' lament all the more powerful. You know, one of the things I think we've lost is the ability to lament. Lament is when you grieve. When you say that what is right now is not what should be, that God has something better that has not yet been achieved. To lament is to move through an experience of disappointment with a pervasive trust that this moment is not the last word. Now, we've stopped lamenting, and we've just sort of gotten pretty good at whining. <laughs> whining is when you just complain and complain about what's wrong and just never take any action. Just complaining. But Jesus laments. Carolyn Winfrey Gillette knows how to lament. She wrote these words to this hymn, days after the massacres of the Muslims at prayer at the mosques in New Zealand. They say it can be sung to the tune that we know of the church's one foundation. She writes, O oh God, we grieve the hatred, the ugly racist fear, that hurts our common living and harms those you hold dear. For Muslims who were gathered to worship and to pray soon found their lives were shattered as violence filled their day. We pray for those now grieving, for loved ones who are lost. We pray for people suffering because of hatred's cost. For all of us now frightened by what extremists do, we pray, O oh God of mercy, may we find strength in you. We grieve our lack of courage. We tolerate the wrong of people who are racist. We simply go along. We let the fear continue. We're slow to challenge hate. We say it's not our issue until it is too late. O oh God of love and mercy, you teach us how to be a loving, caring people, a kind community. May we reach out to neighbors and welcome others here, for love is what is needed to cast out pride and fear. Carolyn knows how to lament. 
to acknowledge that what is in the present moment is not God's best, and then to reach beyond the present moment for all that God wills. That was Jesus. Looking out at the city of Jerusalem, that's Jesus. Looking out at you and at me this morning. Calling us. Calling us to become all that God desires. John Pavlitz is good at lamenting. He writes these words at this particular season of being Christian and maybe even this awkward season of being United Methodists with all that's gone on. I found his words helpful. Yes, I am a Christian, he writes, but there is a Christian I refuse to be. I refuse to be a Christian who lives in fear of people who look or speak or worship differently than I do. I refuse to be a Christian who can't find beauty and truth in religious traditions other than my own. I refuse to be a Christian who is reluctant to call out the words of hateful preachers, venomous politicians, mean-spirited pew-sitters. None of those here I, I know. All in the name of keeping a ceremonial Christian unity. I refuse to be a Christian who is generous with damnation and stingy with grace. I refuse to be a Christian who sees a hopeless world spiraling downward and can only condemn it or withdraw from it. I refuse to be a Christian devoid of the character of Jesus his humility, compassion, his smallness, his gentleness with people's wounds, his attention to the poor and the forgotten, the marginalized, his intolerance for religious hypocrisy, his clear expression of the love of God. I refuse to be a Christian unless it means I live as a person of hospitality, of healing, of redemption, of justice, of an expectation defying grace, of a counterintuitive love. Yes, it's much more difficult to say these days than it has been, ever been in the past but I still do say it. I am still a Christian, but I refuse to be one without Jesus. Well, you don't have to go to Greenfield, Massachusetts to climb to a place of a spiritual vantage point where to look out, where we can look out and see the big picture of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So let us lament what is wrong, not just whine and complain, but to lament in such a way that we reach beyond what is to embrace all that God would give Amen. Hi, I'm Peter Hay, the pastor at Wesley Church, and uh, I want to thank you for viewing this video clip of a recent service. 
There are things about Wesley Church that you simply cannot experience through such a video clip. We are a gathering of people very committed to an inclusive way of living out the Christian faith. And we strive to quiet the conflict among all people by creating a compelling environment that fosters spirituality, community engagement, and social justice. If this vision speaks to your heart as it speaks to ours, we hope you'll join us. We gather for worship three times over the course of a weekend at Wesley Church. At 4 o'clock on Saturday afternoons, we have a casual service where we pray together, we read scripture, and we share in the, in the message in an informal way. And then every Sunday morning at 8.30, we gather in the chapel for a service that includes Holy Communion, in addition to the preaching and the prayers. And then at 10.30, we gather in our main sanctuary, where we are enriched by our wonderful pipe organ and our choir and our band. These are very powerful experiences of Christian nurture, and we would love to have you join us. In our eyes up, our eyes like the day, our eyes up, our eyes unafraid, our eyes up, and I'll do it a thousand times again. In our eyes up, I like the waves, our eyes up, in spite of the age. thousand times again I'll do it a thousand. 